Hi again, everyone, and welcome to the next video in our series on Wordsworth. We're getting towards the end now. This is the second poem from the prelude, the second extract, and it fits quite nicely with the poem uh, The Stolen Boat. If you haven't watched that video yet, probably best to watch that one first because we'll be borrowing some of the information from that in this video too. So here we're going to analyse the poem Skating. This poem, like The Stolen Boat, is an extract from the longer poem that Wordsworth wrote called The Prelude. In this poem, Wordsworth describes something that happened when he was young, an evening when a nearby lake was frozen over so he and other children could skate on it. On the surface the poem is about the happiness that he feels, the excitement that he experiences as well as detailed descriptions of the nature all around him. As always with Wordsworth though there's a deeper meaning too and we'll examine what that is as well as how it connects to some of the other poems that he wrote and that we're studying for the Leaving Cert. For more detailed contextual information and background have a look at the first video in this whole playlist, this whole series, where we go through some of the really important biographical details and key information about Wordsworth himself. So this poem is an extract from the prelude. Uh, the prelude was 8,400 lines long and it was an autobiographical poem that Wordsworth intended to be the introduction to a great epic poem that he never finished. The prelude was started at the beginning of Wordsworth's great decade, 1798, but he never intended it for it to be published or to be read publicly. The prelude and the longer work that would follow were only supposed to be for close friends and family, but this all changed after he died in 1850 and his wife, Mary Hutchinson, published the poem. It had been revised many times, but as we know about Wordsworth from the first video in this series, but also from lots of the other videos where we talk about context and background, he was never completely happy with any of his work, specifically his autobiographical work. So the events described in this poem are about an evening spent skating on a frozen lake with other children. There's a contrast between how he reacts to the events and how the others do. And this fits in well with all that we know about the poet himself and how he sees nature and the natural world. This is a perfect example of one of Wordsworth's famous spots of time. For more on this, go back again to that context and background video at the beginning of the series. So in terms of form, because this is an extract from a longer poem, it's one verse paragraph of 44 lines and it's not broken into stanzas. It is, however, broken into two sections. It's written in free verse, iambic pentameter, similar to Tintern Abbey, one of the most common forms of poetry of that time. Remember, when we spoke about the free verse in Tintern Abbey, we mentioned that although Wordsworth wants to do something new, change and to be radical in his poetry, he doesn't necessarily want to change how the poetry sounds. It's more the content and what it's about. Narrative perspective is really important in this poem. We see everything through a participant of the event and not the mature Wordsworth recollecting the event from a moment of tranquility. So it gives the poem vibrancy and it's different to The Stolen Boat in that sense. The Stolen Boat is written by somebody looking back at the event. This poem, Skating, is written from the narrative perspective of somebody right there in the present moment involved in it. There is more distance and more recollection. Skating is much more about the moment itself, the excitement and the feeling of it. So let's take a look at this poem line by line. So we're going to begin, break it into sections. We're going to look at lines one to six. In the frosty season when the sun was set and visible from many a mile the cottage windows through the twilight blazed, I heeded not the summons. Happy time it was indeed for all of us. For me, it was a time of rapture, clear and loud. So the wintry scene is set and the darkness is enhanced by the image of the lights in windows dotted across the landscape. For most people out in the snow and ice, the sight of a warm fire or a cosy cottage would be a welcome sight, something they would be glad to see. But the young poet heeded not their summons. He was content to stay out because it was a happy time for them all. The distinction here between the fact that it was happy time for all of them but for him in particular, it was a time of rapture. The word rapture doesn't just mean happy. It means intense pleasure or joy. There's biblical connotations too, as some evangelical Christians believe that the rapture is an end of time event where believers will be resurrected and will ascend into heaven to meet God. So here Wordsworth is saying that for everyone, it was a happy time, but for him in particular, 
it was a sort of ecstasy of biblical proportions. He's already separating himself from his fellow skaters, not simply physically, as he does later in the poem anyway, but in terms of how they feel about the event and how they experience it. This rapture is interrupted briefly by the village clock, which he describes as clear and loud. This is the first instance of sound in the poem, and as we will see, Wordsworth uses sound in this poem more so than in his other poems to create a soundscape so the readers can almost hear what's happening as well as see it through the imagery he uses. Line 7 to 13. The village clock told six. I wheeled about proud and exulting like an untired horse that cares not for its home. All shod with steel we hissed along the polished ice in games, confederate, imitative of the chase and woodland pleasures. The resounding horn, the pack loud bellowing and the hunted hare. So what's happening here? Well, the clock announces that it's six o'clock. He turns on the ice, confidently and happy, compares himself to a horse that is untired. This workhorse does not want to go home because it's only interested in work as the young Wordsworth does not want to go home as he is only interested in skating. Just as a horse wears shoes, the skaters are shod with iron, which is their skates. They play games together, confederate, rather than against each other in competition. These games are like a hunt, with hounds and horses all rushing around the countryside. Just as in a hunt there would be the sound of a horn, the pack of dogs barking and the hare running. The way the children are playing on the ice, rushing around together in packs and chasing each other is similar. So what can we say about these lines 7 to 13? There are a couple of things here worth paying attention to. Firstly, the simile here compares him to an untired workhorse as he turns about on the ice. This conveys the energy and athleticism of the young poet who is proud and exulting. We saw in the stolen boat how overconfidence and pride is quickly undercut by nature acting as the moral guide, keeping Wordsworth on the right track. Here, however, this is a different sort of pride. Not so much pride in himself or his own abilities, but proud and happy to be free in nature in this way. There's also a continuation of the onomatopoeia used first when the village clock told six. We see how the skaters hissed along the polished ice. The sibilance here reflects the speed at which the skaters are traveling and it makes it seem thrilling. We hear also the loud bellowing of the children as it's compared to the barking of a pack of dogs in a hunt. The soundscape is important here again as the imagery is quite cold. The sound livens it up and makes it almost lifelike. Okay, lines 14 to 22. So through the darkness and the cold we flew, and not a voice was idle. With the din, meanwhile, the precipices rang aloud, the leafless trees and every icy crag tingled like iron, while the distant hills into the tumult sent an alien sound of melancholy, not unnoticed, while the stars eastward were sparkling clear, and in the west the orange sky of evening died away. So they fly across the ice through the darkness and the cold and everyone's talking or shouting. All the hills and trees and cliff faces around are reflecting the sound back to the people on the lake. The further away hills reflect a more alien sound, one that is tinged with sadness. In the sky the stars are sparkling and the orange from the setting sun has died away. But what can we say about lines 14 to 22? Well, there's a sense of movement emphasised by the iambic pentameter of line 14 in particular. The internal rhythm to it matches the surging movement of skaters across the ice. So through the darkness and the cold we flew. The soundscape is layered upon here with the sound of the voices of the people on the lake. None were idle. So this is described as a din, a loud chaotic sort of a sound. And this sound is layered further with the echoes of the sounds from the people coming back from the nearby rocks, hills and trees. This sound is a cold, hard, metallic one. It tingles like iron. This reinforces the icy, hard environment. But then there is something else introduced through another sound. The happy, excited scene is tempered by a melancholic reflection on the sound that is reflected back to the skaters by the more distant hills. Perhaps there's a sense here of the unknown modes in the stolen boat. Perhaps the distant hills speak to Wordsworth alone and it is an alien sound because it doesn't fit with the joyous mood that everybody else is experiencing. Whatever Wordsworth intended here, he says that it was not unnoticed, which suggests that it has an impact similar to the impact that the huge peak in the stolen boat has on him. Lines 23 to 33. Not seldom from the uproar I retired into a silent bay or sportively glanced sideways, leaving the tumultuous throng to cut across the image of a star that gleamed upon the ice. And oftentimes, when we had given our bodies to the wind, and all the shadowy banks on either side came sweeping through the darkness, spinning still the rapid line of motion, then at once have I, reclining back upon my heels, stopped short, 
yet still the solitary cliffs. So the speaker regularly pauses and separates himself from all the others in the lake, either by skating into a silent bay, which here is a small recess in the lake itself, or simply by looking away from all the others. He looks down to see the reflection of a star from the sky on the ice, and he skates across it. Often, having given in to the wind, almost being at one with it while skating across the ice, it seemed as if it was the banks in shadow because of the time of the evening that were moving and not the skaters. This stops when he stops by reclining back upon his heels and stops short. The break in the two verse paragraphs occurs in different places depending on the text that you use. Remember, a verse paragraph is a group of lines forming a subdivision of a poem. The length of a verse paragraph is decided by the theme or topic rather than any set stanza length. In the original 1850 version, the break occurs here between line 22 and 23. This would make sense as this verse paragraph represents a change in focus, whereas the first verse paragraph focuses on the crowd, the noise, the collective excitement. This one, the second one, represents a departure from this, signified by the phrase at the end of the line, I retired. There is a contrast developed between the din of the first verse paragraph and the silent bay of the second. Despite the noise and the crowd and the excitement, the young Wordsworth is able to find a moment of silence to reflect on the experience. This is summed up with the phrase, leaving the tumultuous throng. The alliteration here capturing the sense of separation from the crowd. When alone, he focuses on the reflection of the star on the ice and he chases it. There's a sense of futility here, perhaps. The young, idealistic, excited Wordsworth chasing something he can't hope to catch. Not just a star, but a reflection of one. The whole poem is characterised by a sense of sound, but also movement. The earlier description of him wheeling around in line 7 connects to how they flew through the dark in line 14, and now the banks of the lake, hidden in shadow, come sweeping through the darkness, spinning still. In a similar way to the stolen boat, nature is being personified as doing the moving, and we have another seeming contradiction with the word still. In the stolen boat, the phrase growing still is used and here it's spinning still. The contrast and the juxtaposition catches our attention and here it forces us to focus on the sense of movement that it creates. This sense of movement is brought to an end as he leans back on the heels of his skates and stopped short. So the last lines, 34 to 38. Wheeled by me, even as if the earth had rolled with visible motion her diurnal round. Behind me did they stretch in solemn train feebler and feebler and I stood and watched till all was tranquil as a summer sea. The solitary cliffs that surround the lake continue to move even though the skater, Wordsworth, has stopped short. The earth is moving still. The diurnal round is the daily rotation of the earth. So what this means is that he's dizzy. So he spins and spins and spins around then he stops but it feels as if everything else is still spinning around him. Behind Wordsworth he sees a line of skaters stretched as if in a train, in a line, following one behind the other. Each subsequent skater is feebler than before, getting smaller and less rambunctious until eventually all is quiet. So what can we say about these lines? Well, a critic noted that while Wordsworth's contemporaries, the other children he's with, are left dizzy after all their skating around in circle, Wordsworth, however, feels the turning of the world itself. His is a poet's sensibility. The impact of these commonplace events are much more dramatic on him than on the other children. The diurnal round, the daily rotation of the earth, is an image he uses in another of his poems, A Slumber Did My Spirit Seal, that we looked at earlier. Here it contributes to the sense of motion experienced by Wordsworth and the other skaters. They are moving around on the ice so quickly that they are making themselves dizzy. Even after stopping, the young Wordsworth still feels things moving around him. He attributes it to the motion of the earth, but this rep reminds us of a point that he makes in Tintern Abbey, where he refers to the idea of God as a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. Or in a slumber did my spirit seal, where he says, rolled round in earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. This recurring image or idea of the earth's motion being connected to a deeper force in nature reappears here, and the young Wordsworth is the only one of the skaters to fully appreciate it. The final image is a tranquil summer sea. The poem ends on a positive note. This interaction with nature, unlike in the stolen boat, leaves him feeling positive about the future. The idea of summer contrasts to the winter scene created in the first line, and the final line makes use of sibilance to bring the frantic motion and noise of the poem to a gradual close. The summer sea. In terms of language, 
Wordsworth uses lots of assonance in the poem to create the soundscape that we talked about previously. This soundscape adds to the imagery that we see to create the full experience. Onomatopoeia is also used to communicate this and surging rhythms help to communicate the urgency and sense of life in the poem itself. This is an exuberant celebration of nature in contrast to the stolen boat. The poem is filled with sound and movement and the icy landscape is recollected with harsh metallic sounds and there's a clear contrast between the noisy tumult and the distant sound of the hills. In terms of structure, the structure of skating is a division of the entire experience into two parts. The first verse paragraph focuses on the collective external experience, the noise, the sound. The second verse paragraph focuses on the absence of sound and the interior experience the impact of the experience on Wordsworth himself. So what can we argue about this? Well, while this poem is different to The Stolen Boat in terms of mood, it's much more a celebration of the beauty and wonder of nature than a recognition of the fear that nature can inspire. There are plenty of similarities to it and other of Wordsworth's poems. This poem seems to confirm what we know about Wordsworth's attitude to nature, specifically how he reflects on his experience and this deepens it for him. There's another issue that we can focus on and that's the fact that it's autobiographical and it's been written many years after the event itself. The perfect nature of the scene in this, as well as the stolen boat, may be as much to do with autobiographical editing as it is to do with a perfect lesson being taught by nature. I hope that you found this video useful. I hope that you found all of the videos in this series useful and we're building up towards our last few videos. Please subscribe to the channel, like and comment and please do come back for more as they go up.